Oda has burnt the whole kitchen with how well he has cooked this chapter. Trust me, you don't want to miss a single minute of this video, because in this chapter we are going to see Karabo joining the Blackbeard Pirates, the giant warrior pirates cleaning up the Vice Admirals, the names of all the nine Vice Admirals, and Saturn's new form. And in the final part of the chapter, we will also brace ourselves for the announcement that is going to shock the world. So watch till the very end of this video, because you do not want to miss even a single detail of this spicy chapter. One Piece Manga Chapter 1108, titled Attention World. On the cover page of this chapter, Oda gives us a majestically illustrated double spread of the most beautiful One Piece beauties. They are chilling and drinking together with each other on an elegant Chesterfield sofa. They are also accompanied by three Yorkshire Terriers. This color spread is to promote the new One Piece novel titled Heroines, which will be out on the 4th of March. So do check that out when it releases. The chapter begins with the pacifista sinking marine ships, one after the other. While there are still more than 50 ships left to destroy, the pacifistas and the giants are making good work of it. The scene shifts to somewhere on Egghead Island. We continue from right where Chapter 1107 left off. It's Caribou, and he's down on his knees, pleading relentlessly to Katarina, Devon, and Van Auger. Katarina is curious about Caribou and what his story is, and Van Auger tells her that he's Wet-Haired Caribou. The name Wet-Haired Caribou has been around since he debuted in Chapter 600. It's interesting to see him being referred to as Wethead Caribou like he is a proper pirate. This also shows Van Auger's competence as he immediately identifies who Caribou is. Van Auger points his Senriku at him with the intention to shoot, but Caribou tells him to hold on. Van Auger takes aim as he tells Caribou that he may be a pirate, but this is a government's island. Van Auger also adds that there are people after the Commodore's life. And by Commodore, he means their captain, Blackbeard. But notice the phrasing. Van Auger casually accuses Caribou of being a threat just because they are on a government island. Why? It's because there is always the possibility that Caribou is a spy for the government. Van Auger obviously has no problem shooting him right then and there. As Van Auger is about to pull the trigger, Caribou pleads even more relentlessly. He asks them to trust him, and he also adds something that finally gets their attention. Caribou tells them that if they kill him here, Commodore Teach will have their heads. Van Auger is intrigued. He humors Caribou by asking him, Why is that? Caribou is drooling all over the place when he reveals that he has extremely valuable information, and with special emphasis on extremely valuable, and the kind of information that is hard to come by. And we know that it's true, right? It's hard to believe, but it's true. The only people in the world who know the whereabouts about Pluton and Poseidon are the Straw Hat Pirates and Caribou himself. Back in Chapter 650, he learned the fact that Shira Hoshi is the ancient weapon Poseidon, who has the power to destroy the world. And then in Chapter 1056, he overheard it when Robin told Luffy and the others about how Pluton is under Wano. In both those cases, we saw Caribou make unusually suspicious expressions as he mentioned that a certain someone would love this information. So there you have it guys, in chapter 1108, we finally have the confirmation that the certain someone was Blackbeard all along, but it is also obvious that Caribou has not had any prior contact with Blackbeard whatsoever, otherwise he wouldn't be pleading like this. Caribou tells Van Auger and Katarina Devon that if they bring him to the Commodore, he will surrender that extremely valuable information free of charge. He further stresses the fact that Blackbeard would be pleased, especially when Van Auger had said in the previous chapter that the world was their objective. Now, on the surface, wet-haired caribou definitely does not look like a trustworthy person at all, and so I understand why Katarina and Van Auger are suspicious. But after he tells them about the information, 
you can see it on their faces that they are intrigued as well. Keep in mind that he hasn't yet told them about what exactly the information is. The scene shifts back to the shore, where marine ships are getting blasted by the pacifistas. They are ordered to pull back from the shore, and the marines also realize that they have to stop firing at the pacifistas. Which makes sense. The pacifistas can sink as many of the ships as they want. On the other hand, whenever they shoot at the pacifistas, it gets blocked by the bubble shield. We see it happen to one ship right after the other ships begin to pull back. One of the marines is losing his mind. He curses those bubble shields and mentions how he never thought that they'd learn about the power of the science group like this. One of the pacifistas detects them, takes aim, shoots, and sinks their ship right there and then. Now in response to this fiasco, we get some interesting dialogue from the Vice Admirals. Vice Admiral Bluegrass admits that it's frustrating. She can't cut loose, and she knows that they just keep hurting themselves if they continue to try and take out the pacifistas. Vice Admiral Hound asks something shocking. First he admits that it'd be unprecedented, and then asks if there is any chance of calling off the buster call for now. Vice Admiral Guillotine is a little hot-blooded. He reminds them that Vegapunk himself gave that pirate the authority to command the pacifistas. He adds that there is no way they can stop them. In response to his words, one of the marines says that after this, there is no doubt Vegapunk is rebel scum while another marine adds that they should focus on getting the pacifistas back on their side. Vice Admiral Doberman replies to this with an announcement. He proclaims that getting the pacifista back on their side means taking Jewel Ribani's head. A moment later, Doberman declares that all available Vice Admirals should leave their stations and hunt her down immediately. He also announces that Bonnie's current escape route from the center of the Fabro Stratum will lead her to the northeast coast, and then once again, stresses the need to eliminate her. Conveniently, one of the Vice Admirals was already closing in on her. It's Vice Admiral Tosa. He affirms Doberman's order and informs them that he is already hot on the target's heels, and that he will eliminate Bonnie. He pulls out his fingers and says that these fingers will drag Bonnie to hell. Vice Admiral Tosa begins to take the classic Kamehameha pose. He's oddly confident in his attack. He knows that his 10-barrel finger gun can even rip open armor. With this confidence, Tosa pounces on them. Both Bonnie and Frankie turn around and see him mere inches away from them. They're left stunned. Tosa's stealth game is good because they really did not notice him until he was this up close. Vice Admiral Tosa yells the name of his attack, Tosa Crunch. But before he could land the attack, Tosa was crushed by a giant mace. This is definitely not the most normal situation though. First it was a Marine Vice Admiral that suddenly popped up behind them. And now it's literal giants who have also somehow pulled up from out of nowhere. Bonnie screams in shock, just like any 12-year-old girl would. Huh? There are giants on this island? Frankie spells this out for us. He also wonders if they are also their enemies. Atlas looks in shock as she sees the giants. Dory and Broggy ask who they are. Broggy told them that they had checked the bounty posters in advance to make sure that they'd recognize the new members. He also admits that none of them look familiar and asks if they are researchers. So why doesn't Frankie look familiar to Broggy? After Wano the Straw Hat Pirates had their bounties updated. We saw how pissed Frankie was when his bounty went up, but it was a picture of Thousand Sunny. So that's why Broggy does not know that Frankie is part of the Straw Hats. Dory, on the other hand, just says it how it is. We've come to get the Straw Hats. Frankie immediately asks the reason. He thinks that they are here to actually get them and not just escort them to safety. He mentions that Luffy is his captain and asks the Giants if they have a grudge against him. Dory and Broggy just smile and tell Frankie that it's nothing like that. They only have gratitude for Luffy. Dory then introduces themselves to Frankie. 
He tells him that they are warriors from Elbaf. He further adds that so long as they are friends of Luffy, they will do their best to keep them safe. Immediately after hearing that, Bonnie immediately mentions Luffy, Sanji, and Vegapunk. She tells them that they are still back there and asks Dory and Broggy if they can help them too. Broggy smiles at Bonnie and tells her that those names sure take him back. Dory then asks Broggy about Vegapunk. He wants to confirm that Vegapunk was the one that a scholar had mentioned. The scholar is most likely to be Jaguar de Saul. After all, he was the one who saved those books, and Vegapunk started reading those books to learn about the Void Century. Dory tells his crewmates to take Frankie, Bonnie, Atlas, and Kuma to safety while he and Broggy march on ahead. Their crewmates affirm the command and carry the gang. Frankie realizes that these giant allies could be the masters whom Usopp was always going on about. The scene shifts back to the Vice Admirals. Vice Admiral Urban tells the other Vice Admirals that the line has gone dead. Vice Admiral Pomsky begins to question whether Bonnie countered his attacks or was it the giants that intervened. Regardless, he adds that he is heading to the island. Bluegrass, on the other hand, isn't waiting around. She tells Dahl to hop on the Sea Beast and begins to charge forward. Dahl says that the ship on the northeast shore of the island is definitely from Elbaf. Bluegrass replies that their fortune keeps flip-flopping. She also asks Dahl if she has ever fought a giant. Dahl replies that her commanding officer 20 years ago was a giant. Bluegrass easily catches that she is talking about Saul. Because, well, Dahl used the past tense. This is actually a nice little detail when you think about it, because how often does a giant even die? They live for several centuries, and they're durable by default. So, if Dahl used the past tense to describe a giant who served in the Marines, it simply makes sense that it would have been the only one who has actually, allegedly, died since then. The scene shifts to where the giants are carrying Frankie, Bonnie, Atlas, and Kuma. They ask about the others and where they are. Frankie replies that they are in a lab above the clouds. The giant then wonders if Frankie was talking about a lab on the Sky Island. But Frankie tells them that it's literally just above them. The scene shifts to the center of Egghead Island. It's Vegapunk. He is down on the ground, unable to move. Luffy asks him how they're supposed to save him when they can't move him. Vegapunk replies that if they try, he will just die from internal hemorrhaging. And as the conversation continues, Saturn begins to shift into a massive demonic form. He's using his beast transformation, and it is as ugly, intimidating, and satanic as you'd expect it to be. Just abhorrent and hideous, and Sanji is facing toward him with no fear. The conversation between Luffy and Vegapunk continues. Luffy reminds Vegapunk how they promised to get him off the island. Vegapunk says that although they did promise, he has made his peace, and there are things he must protect. Vegapunk expresses his sadness over how he was hoping that Bonnie's command, Override, would have remained a secret till she was a little bit older. Now she'll be a target for the rest of her life. And so Vegapunk asks Luffy to please look after her. Is this the defining moment where Luffy will ask Bonnie to join his crew? And I'm not liking this, my fellow Nakama. The death flags around our old man are skyrocketing right before our eyes. Like I've said in the previous chapters, he would just tell everyone to leave him behind. I hope that this is not the case at all. The scene closes in on Sanji. He smokes his cigarette in the classic Sanji pose as he makes a comment on Saturn's transformation. So, He says that Saturn has given up any pretense of looking human. There is a strange look in his eye, and it seems he is completely coated in venom too. <laughs> Suddenly Saturn attacks Luffy, Sanji, and Vegapunk with all eight of his legs. Sanji was the one who was facing Saturn, so he is also the one who tells Luffy to dodge as Saturn's claw comes at him at a disgusting pace. Sanji himself picks up Vegapunk and flees as Luffy tells him to get Gramps out of here. Luffy also tells Sanji to not stop, even if he is moaning about the pain. No problem. 
Sanji says. He runs. While Luffy keeps dodging Saturn's attacks, he's having fun. <laughs> but do you know who's not having fun? Vegapunk. Ouch, ouch, he says twice before asking Sanji to just leave him there. But Sanji isn't going to just leave him there. He tells Vegapunk to simmer it down, because they'll figure something out. However, Sanji doesn't even realize it before. He has already been hit in the face with Kizaru's kick. He loses hold of Vegapunk, and Kizaru uses the opportunity to pierce Vegapunk yet again. This time, with his sword made of pure light. No! Sanji screams as he calls Vegapunk's name. Now I need to know, is making donuts part of the Admiral's job? We saw what Akainu did to Ace in the Marinford arc, and in Chapter 1088, we saw former Admiral Kuzan looking at Garp with a wound through the chest. And now we see Kizaru making a donut by piercing Vegapunk's body. Let me know in the comments below. Luffy also calls out to Vegapunk. He immediately tells Sanji to just get to the back entrance. As instructed, Sanji instantly picks up Apple Gramps and apologizes for screwing up as he rushes towards the back entrance. Kizaru turns to chase after them, but this is where Oda slaps us with a cold, hard panel of Luffy. Grabbing Kizaru with one hand while stopping Saturn with the other. Yes, he's taking on an Admiral and a Gorose at the same time. Luffy is not the one getting overpowered. It's them. Another reason why this is so badass is because we clearly see anger on Luffy's face despite the fact that he's using Gear 5th. That is cold. To all the haters who say that G5 is goofy and Luffy's aura is gone, this is for you. He tells Kizaru that there is no way he is letting him escape as Kizaru's mouth splurts out blood. Saturn, on the other hand, looks frightened. Guys, it's going to happen. This arc won't end with an escape. It would end with an absolute undeniable victory of Luffy against both the Marines and the world government. But wait, the chapter isn't over yet. Sanji anxiously asks Vegapunk not to die on him. He also asks what he's smiling about as he tells Vegapunk to stay with him, to not die. And as this happens, we also hear beep sounds. Beep, beep. It's the same beep you hear when someone dies in the ICU. The scene shifts to a room. There is a small black computer screen showing us that Vegapunk's heartbeat has stopped. And just like that, something is triggered. And Vegapunk is on the computer addressing the entire world. First, he tests his mic and then calls for the entire world's attention. He also adds, hello there, which could be a reference to the good old hello world. Vegapunk then introduces himself as the world's greatest and most humble scientific genius. He says that he is sure this message will come as a shock to everyone, and right as the chapter ends, Vegapunk declares that he is about to tell them all the truth about the world. What do you think, guys? I think this is a pre-installed announcement that was supposed to be triggered whenever Vegapunk's heart stops beating. Yes, this announcement is probably pre-recorded that will now be broadcasted to the entire world. Is this it? Is this the egghead event that is meant to shock the world? For the past 800 years, the world government has committed every kind of evil just to make sure that the truth never gets out. But now it's going to be revealed to everyone? It's honestly hard to properly conceptualize how much things are going to escalate in the next couple of chapters. And to begin with, what is going to happen to Vegapunk now that his heart has literally stopped beating? So many questions, so much to look forward to. Let's continue this discussion in the comments section down below. Press like if you enjoyed the video and if you don't want to miss out on future One Piece chapters like this one, definitely subscribe and hit that bell icon. There will be no break next week, so see you in the next chapter. Thank you.